You gave a promise. You brought upon them only ruin and death. You've won the mountain, is that not enough? Well, hello everybody, how you doing? It's time to talk about Middle Earth on the big screen for probably the last time, or at least most likely the last time in my lifetime. This is Peter Jackson's The Hobbit, The Battle of the Five Armies. Uh, actually got to see this one in advance of its North American release, which won't mean a whole lot to my international viewers since most of you have had this movie in theaters for at least a week already, you lucky, lucky bastards. But, well, it is what it is. Uh, the plot for this one picks up right at the end of uh, the Desolation of Smaug, right where we left off with uh, the Cumber Dragon making its way toward Lake Town to turn it into a giant pile of ash. And while all that's going on, we still have Gandalf being held captive by the Necromancer, who we now know to be Sauron at Dol Guldur, and his friends trying to launch a rescue there. And once all of that is resolved, then we have... Thorin, who has now reclaimed Erebor, but possibly not for long, as we have massive armies of orcs marching on Erebor, hoping to evict the new dwarven king. And if that wasn't enough, he also has to contend with the armies of the elves and the humans, who are making their own march on Erebor to claim what they feel is their rightful share of the treasure. And if that wasn't enough, Thorin also has to contend with his own inner demons, as he is slowly being overtaken by the same dragon sickness, the same overwhelming greed and lust for gems and gold and the Arkenstone that ultimately drove his grandfather to madness, and the same thing is now happening to him. And all that in the span of about 2 hours and 24 minutes. And yes, you heard me correct on that. This is by far the shortest Peter Jackson Middle Earth movie that has come out to date. Uh, most of these movies are three hours or very close to it, and the extended editions are even worse. <laughs> um, Return of the King, especially, I think was a little bit over the four-hour mark, actually. Uh, but yeah, this one doesn't even hit two and a half hours. I'm sure the extended edition, when it is ultimately released on DVD and Blu-ray, will more than make up for that, but for right now, this is all we get. And really, that's probably a good thing, because most of this movie is focused on just one big battle, the titular Battle of the Five Armies. And because of that, it's kind of light on plot. I mean, there's it's not completely devoid of plot. There's still plenty of stuff going on, but definitely not enough to fit a three-hour movie. So cutting this down below the two-and-a-half-hour mark was definitely a good choice. Now, while it's a bit light on plot, it is very heavy on action. So if you like these massive Peter Jackson epic battles, there's plenty to enjoy here. There's no shortage of action in this movie, and it's all very well done, which you would expect from PJ at this point. Uh, the uh, final battle itself is huge and long and very epic in scope, and the action sequences are all very well done. Special effects all look fantastic. We finally get to see a dwarven army in action at long last, because we didn't see any of that in Lord of the Rings, and in the first two Hobbit movies, we saw a couple of flashbacks here and there, like back to the Battle of Moria, but that was really it. And here, the dwarves are out in full force and kicking ass. So definitely good to finally see some of that. And... Of course, we still have plenty of Legolas defying the laws of physics, as he so often does. Uh, there's one moment in particular where it it kind of felt like they were trying to top the uh, you know the killing of the mummy kill from Return of the King, and it is so goddamn ridiculous. It really is. It, in a way, it's kind of awesome because it's so ridiculous. But there's another part of me that thinks you know maybe you should have reined it in a bit because you know. The moment where he kills the Mumma Kill in Return of the King, you weren't going to top that. And it doesn't really top them here, but damned if they aren't going to try. And, and it still only counts as one. Visually, the movie looks fantastic, but again, I really shouldn't have to tell you that because it's a Peter Jackson, Lord of the Rings adaptation, or the Hobbit adaptation, I should say. You know it's going to look fantastic. It still does, and still looks very good in 3D. Uh, the screening I attended was in 3D. It was not in the high frame rate. They were showing just the standard 24 frames a second, 
which is fine. I mean, the, the high frame rate does lend itself pretty well to the 3D, I've found, but, you know, it's, it's still a very polarizing thing. Some people like it, some don't, and I'm sure if you saw either of the first two movies in the high frame rate, you've already made up your own mind as well, so you don't need me to talk about that, really. And overall, there's a uh, still plenty of silliness going on, like there was in the first two movies, uh, especially in the, uh, the action sequences, but there's also quite a few serious moments as well, and the movie does get uh, pretty dark and grim and even a bit scary at times, and uh, usually they tend to balance each other pretty well, but there are a few moments where they throw in some uh, comic relief that really doesn't fit. Uh, it, it's it's kind of a mixed bag there. So, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. There's not much in the way of new characters in this movie. Really, the only new character is Dane, who is played by Billy Connolly. And Dane is the leader of the Dwarvish army who shows up to help out his cousin Thorin when he has all these rather nasty people knocking on his door trying to get at his treasure. And if you want to know what his character is like, just imagine Billy Connolly playing a dwarf. It's exactly what you think it is. <laughs> uh, and it's kind of a shame that they didn't go more into detail about his character. I was hoping we would get a bit more about his backstory and whatnot, but really, he just shows up and spouts off a few funny one-liners and kicks some ass, and that's about all he does. And again, there's going to be an extended edition. Maybe we'll get more of it there, but I kind of wish they had put a bit more of that in the theatrical cuts. Um, another character that kinda got the shaft, is Bayorn, who shows up in the battle only for about 10-15 seconds, and that's it. Um, I haven't read the book in quite some time, but I seem to recall that basically as far as Bayorn's involvement in the Battle of the Five Armies, the book basically just says he was there. And that's about it. And unfortunately, the movie does the same thing, which is a shame. I mean, I know there's not much more to him other than giant bear busting orc heads. But at the same time, giant bear busting orc heads. Why would you not want to see more of that? Serious, 10 to 15 seconds, not enough, not enough. No, 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 no. And I, I'm sure we'll see more in the extended edition, but I wanted more now. I need more giant bear, please. Is that too much to ask? I think not. As far as the rest of the characters go, I did like what they did with uh, Thorin and his slow descent into madness um, while he's basically walling himself up in Erebor and as he slowly starts to distrust all of his friends and his fellow kinsmen and just becomes more possessed by his greed and eventually just wants nothing more than to cast all of his friends aside and just sit on top of his giant pile of gold with a thumb of his dwarven ass for the rest of his days. And it's played very well by Richard Armitage. Uh, he's outstanding in this, as he often is. And uh, we also got to see a bit of some other characters that you might remember, uh, most from Lord of the Rings. Uh, pretty much when a uh, they launch the big rescue of Gandalf from Dol Guldur. The whole thing is pretty much a cameo fest. Uh, Radagast, Galadriel, Elrond, and Saruman all show up and get a piece of the action, or at least uh, Christopher Lee's stunt double gets a piece of the action, because uh, the man is 92 and not nearly as mobile as he used to be. In fact, he basically shot all of his scenes in London on a green screen because he wasn't capable of making the trip down to New Zealand. Uh, which is a shame, but Perfectly understandable, given the man's age. Uh, he's, what, 92? Yeah, that, that, when I'm 92, I'm sure I won't be that mobile either. So, yeah, perfectly understandable. Nice to see them, but it's uh, it's too bad that they couldn't do more, because, really, they show up to bust Gandalf out of jail, and then they just go off to kill some time until Fellowship of the Ring. Or in the case of Radagast, he just goes off and disappears into the wilderness, and that's it. Uh, nice to see them, but... You know, wish they could maybe have done a little bit more instead of just, hi, whoosh, 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 bye. But what can you do? So what else can I talk about here? Oh, the romance. Oh, yes. That's 
that wonderful, wonderful love triangle subplot that barely qualifies as a love triangle. I mentioned this when I, in my comments about the desolation of Smaug. Uh, the uh, love triangle between Toriel, Legolas, and Keeley is really a love triangle in name only because there is no romantic chemistry whatsoever between Legolas and Toriel. The only reason we know there's any romantic tension between there is because Thranduil just flat out spells it out for the audience. And if he hadn't done that, we never would have known, and it would have just been this weird little romance between elf and dwarf. And in this movie, it's pretty much the same thing. And it goes absolutely nowhere and just feels completely tacked on. And I should have known that's what would happen in hindsight because I have read the book and I know what happens to these characters. I mean, I don't know what happens to Toriel, of course, because, you know, she's not in the book. She's purely created for the movies. But I know what happens to Legolas and I know what happens to Keeley. And there ain't no way this can go anywhere unless they make a huge deviation from the source material, and they don't. So the whole thing just feels incredibly tacked on and a complete waste of time, and really they could have dropped this entire thing and it really wouldn't have mattered. And that's too bad because I don't have a problem with Evangeline Lilly. Her performance is fine. I... I mentioned this before with uh, Desolation of Smaug. I don't even have a problem with the character herself. The character fits into this universe just fine. I have no problem with her. It's just the romantic subplot doesn't really work all that well. Another thing I didn't really care for, uh, the character Alfred, who was played by... Who played him? Ryan Gage, that's right. Um, Alfred is a... Uh, the master of Lake Town's second-in-command that was introduced in The Desolation of Smaug. He's still around in this movie for far too long, and now, here's the thing. With a character that is, you know, the, the grand comedic asshole like the master of Lake Town, played excellently by Stephen Fry, because I don't think that man is capable of a bad performance, with a character like that, there are really only two paths that he can take. Either he eventually gets his comeuppance, or he redeems himself. And one of those things happens, I'm not going to say which, but one of those happens, and so after that, he is no longer the grand comedic asshole of the movie, so that role just kind of gets passed on to Alfred. And I don't really think this is a fault of Gage's acting, it's really just that the character is not written nearly as well as the Master of Lake Town was. And, you know, they, they try so hard to make him the comic relief, and after a while, he just starts to get annoying. And again, like the Master of Lake Town, two ways this character can go. Either he gets his comeuppance, or he redeems himself. And neither happens. About midway through the Battle of the Five Armies, he just leaves. It's like, well, I've done enough in this movie. Exit stage left. Gone. Like, could they really not think of what to do with this character? And, and if that was the case, why was he there at all? Why not just get rid of him? Surely it would have been fairly easy to do so. You know, you... The, the entire village of Lake Town is being lit on fire by the Cumber Dragon. Just say he got burned up in the flames, you know, won't be missed. Easily could have axed him, but for whatever reason, they decided to keep him around. One more thing I can comment on, uh, which I, I will probably have to get into spoilers to talk about this regarding the, uh, the fate of certain characters. Uh, the spoiler-free version is, I thought it was handled very well. And I like how they expanded on what the book tells us about these characters, which really was not very much. Uh, in the case of some of them, I think it was only a sentence. Uh, uh, trying to avoid spoilers there, in case there's anyone who has not read the book who would like to see this movie. If you had read the book, you know who I'm talking about. Um, so I'll go into a bit more detail here, but got to throw up the spoiler tag for this. So if you don't want spoilers, click the mute button now. Right now. Do it. Three, two, one. Okay. So, if you've read the book, you probably guessed I'm talking about Feely, Keely, and Thorin. 
who all bite the big one in the end. Uh, and again, I haven't read the book in quite some time, but I seem to recall that uh, Feely and Keeley's death was just... They fell defending Thorin. And that's it. <laughs> like, we, we hear no more than that. And then eventually Thorin dies as well, although he gets to say a few last words before he finally passes. And it plays out similarly in the movie, but we actually get to see how these characters meet their end. Uh, and actually, Feely is the first one to go. He actually gets uh, uh, captured by the orcs and is killed right in front of his brother, which is pretty horrifying, actually. Um, and then eventually... Keeley goes down in battle as well, right before Toriel's eyes, so they can milk that romantic angle one last time. And then Thorin has his big final battle with Azog, and I was... I, I knew Thorin would have to die unless, of course, they make a huge change from the book, which I did not expect them to do, and they don't. So I was just hoping that he would go out like a badass. And he does. Uh... Basically, while he's uh, fighting with Azog, in the end, he gets pinned down by the huge uh, albino orc. <laughs> and uh, that was terrible. I'm never going to say that again. But anyway, yeah, he gets pinned down by the orc and is, you know, the orc is thrusting his spear closer and closer while Thorin is trying to hold him off with his own sword. And eventually he just realizes, oh shit, there's no way out of this. I'm going to die. Well, fuck it. And he just lets the sword fall to his side, and Azog stabs him right in the chest. And as the big orc is standing over his kill, satisfied that he has finally set out what he aimed to do and wipe Thorin's bloodline off the face of the earth, or the Middle Earth as it was, Thorin suddenly musters the last bit of his strength and drives his sword up into, into Azog's heart, like, fuck you, you're coming with me. Very nicely done. In the end, while this movie was definitely more style than substance, it was still very entertaining for what it was, and I enjoyed it. Uh, I still think that they should have stuck with their original plan and made this two movies instead of three, because uh, considering how light on plot this last movie was, that you would think there was some room to trim the fat just a little bit and cram this all into two movies. Uh, Probably could have done it with one, honestly, but uh, that, I, I still think two would have been fine. There's enough material when you, you know, count all the stuff that happens kind of off screen with, you know, the necromancer and whatnot. It could have been done in two. But it is what it is, and it's nowhere near as good as the Lord of the Rings trilogy, but still perfectly entertaining. I, I still liked it, honestly. As for whether I would recommend this, well, that's... Pretty easy, actually. If you like the first two movies, go see this one. If you did not like the first two movies, don't bother, because you're probably not going to like this either. And if you haven't seen the first two movies, you should probably do that first, because otherwise you are going to be lost. You know, especially the second movie, because this one picks up the instant where it leaves off, and otherwise you're not going to have the slightest clue what's going on. And yeah, I think it's worth paying full price for. I think it's worth the 3D surcharge. And again, whether it's worth the high frame rate, that's entirely up to you. You know whether you like that or not by now. And that's about it. So until next time, take care.